Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Great to see such a healthy crowd braving this inclement, dark, rainy weather. <laughs> to hear some chatting about one of the darkest and most disturbing films ever made. Um, you can keep me company in the darkness. I'm very attracted to dark films. And that, of course, is the essence of Hollywood, after all, sharing things in the dark with strangers. Um, I am Donald Brackett. Thank you. I have a confession to make. I am a film critic. <laughs> but I am not the kind of film critic that tells people what's good and bad and what they should see and don't see, because I think life is too short to tell people what not to see. I only talk about good films and great films. And this, of course, is one of the greatest films ever made. In addition to being a film critic, I'm the second cousin of Charles Brackett, who's the writer-producer of this film, with the writer-director, Billy Wilder. Um, that gives me a bit of a behind-the-scenes, inside-story sort of feeling. It certainly did when I was growing up. This is the film we're going to be talking about, the bright, garish colors of a gorgeously black-and-white film noir classic. And it gives definition to what film noir really is. It is a murder mystery, even though you know exactly who was murdered and there is no mystery from the very beginning. Uh, Ready for My Close-Up is the name of the lecture, the making of Wilder and Brackett's Sunset Boulevard. In this lecture, we will explore the dynamics behind the creation of this 1950 film noir classic, Sunset Boulevard. The subtitle is A Hollywood Story, and the producer and director and the writers felt that that was really part of the title. And it really should be, because it's about the machinations of Hollywood, the industry behind the scenes. And it was quite controversial at the time. And in fact, it was kept secret under wraps, hidden from the producers and the studio executives as to what its real subject was about until the very last minute. And they actually gave it a funny title, and they never showed more than a few pages of the script to these studio executives, because it was about them, of course. And it was about famous stars, um, perhaps one of the greatest stars of the silent era, for whom I think the term diva, Hollywood diva, was almost invented, along with Greta Garbo, of course. But we're also going to be looking at the highly combustible and competitive partnership between the director, Billy Wilder, and the writer-producer, Charles Brackett, who, as I said, was my second cousin on my father's side. We'll also examine the film's large social impact on popular culture, in particular, the fascination with fame and celebrity that saturates our contemporary social networks, and the film's prophetic nature in showing over 60 years now, 60 years ago, the dangers of unbridled star adulation and celebrity worship. It was quite visionary in that respect. It's also about self-absorption, long before we had uh, the milieu of young people's social media, the reality programs that have evolved out of that self-absorption. So it warned us about what was going to be coming. Some cinematic works of art have such an intuitive prescience into the human condition that they seem as fresh and insightful today as when they were produced. Sunset Boulevard is just such a film. I first saw it when I was 10 years old. It was made, of course, in 1950. So I saw it in 1960, almost by accident. I was home from school uh, with the flu, or pretending to have the flu, turned on the television, at that point, glorious black and white television. Uh, I'm not as fond of color movies, even, as black and white films. And I miss black and white television. I don't know if any of you do. But since I'm so absorbed in this particular era of films, and still black and white films are made, of course, but I think they have a precious quality, photographic and aesthetic quality, um, that can't be matched by color. This is the book that I'm writing on the partnership between Charles Brackett and Billy Wilder and all the films they made. Um, and it's really the one from, the research comes from this study for this book, Strange Magic, the films of Charles Brackett and Billy Wilder. Um, it was called the golden age of Hollywood for good reason. The early evolutionary phase of the film industry, which we can designate as being roughly between 1929 and 1959, of course, lots of debate on when that golden age is, uh, to me, it's more of an aluminum age in these days. But immediately established this period, the stylistic devices, the narrative techniques, the creative content, and the future direction that cinema would take as both a visual art form and a commercial business enterprise. And that's the most important thing, uh, certainly, that I'm interested in studying in the book, how it can be both art and commerce at its best. This is a film program uh, my next question relates to how many people have seen Sunset Boulevard. Fantastic. In that case, you can see it again when the film program comes out. 
I've curated a program at the Pacific Cinema Tech coming up, which is on Howe Street, and it's all 13 of the films made by Charles Bracken and Billy Wilder together. The first half of them are when they were writers together, because they first started writing for the great Ernst Lubitsch, that director, and slowly they became disenchanted with the power that the studios had over changing the words they produced. That's why one of them became their producer, one of them became the director, and they, both of them continued being the writer. They wanted absolute control over the words. Most importantly, perhaps, the paradoxical fact that cinema could be both entertaining and profitable, as well as both philosophically challenging and emotionally comforting, although it often disturbs us, as this film does. But they, in this golden age, already etched in celluloid, almost from the beginnings, at the turn of the century. These are the films on the right, that they're most famous for. And the unique thing that's the second part of both the film, the book I'm writing, and the film program that I'm curating, which starts May 23rd, by the way, it's probably not yet up on the Pacific Cinematheque website, but it soon will be, and their program will be produced. But May 23rd is the opening double feature uh, of that series. The unique thing about them is, of course, that they made iconic screwball comedies at the same time as iconic film noir dramas that were tragedies. And how they did this is what fascinates me in the book. Modern technology. <laughs> Fine cinema is quite simply the best of both of these worlds. There were, of course, truly great films before 1929 and after 1959, obviously, but they often demonstrate the overlooked fact that film, like every other cultural communication device, is recursive, reiterative, and it clearly illustrates the spiral growth pattern which each historical element in a film builds on the last and builds towards the next, the next innovation exponentially, which explains sort of why each film, they become more violent or they become sexier or they become crazier because we're continually pushing the envelope if the reason if, if, even is an envelope. But once it gets underway, this pattern almost inevitably leads directly from D.W. Griffith who practically invented in 1915 the narrative technique of film, the language of film, right up to Terence Malick, who's an eccentric director who's just released his uh, perhaps 10th film in 30 years. But it's a breathtaking lineage that continues to astonish us with its apparently limitless potential for human storytelling. Storytelling never grows old, and it can be done in many new ways, and the making of shared meaning in our cultural lives. Because mirror, films mirror us, they, they tell our story, really. Some, we identify with some of them more than others, but that's what their function is. So some of the, ma the famous comedies are on the, the top, Ninochka with Greta Garbo, another of the great divas from 1939, uh, Ball of Fire with Barbara Stanwyck on the right side going down, and Gary Cooper, and Major in the Minor with Ray Land and Ginger Rogers. Screwball comedies, they kind of defined this technique. Today, there are many screwball comedies, they're not called that, but they're, they're very, um, shall I say, rude and crude. Whereas these individuals had a technique of writing, creating wit and charm and very sophisticated writing that was very snappy. They, they got away with a, gr a great deal. There were censors in those days, but they got away with a great deal by being subtle and having double entendres and techniques that we can really appreciate, more so than being hit over the head. Um, the tragedies are more so on the left, The Lost Weekend for which they won an Academy Award in 1945, uh, Jane Wyman and Ray Milan, about an alcoholic who's going through detoxification, the DTs, for an affair with Marlena Dietrich, uh, and of course this masterpiece, Sunset Boulevard. Among the many screenwriters, producers, and directors who blazed that ever-expanding trail, few would have the impact on both comedy and tragedy quite as important and long-lasting as the iconic collaborative partnership between the writer-producer Charles Brackett and the writer-director Billy Wilder ironically referred to by critics at the time in Hollywood as the happiest couple in Hollywood, despite the fact that they disliked each other very intensely, did not get along, completely different temperaments, and they are often identified by critics at the time as Brackett and Wilder, one word, just, just one word, because they were a kind of structural unit, each depended on the other to a really outlandish degree, very similar to the dependence that, let's say, John Lennon and Paul McCartney had. One without the other just wasn't quite the same. The artistic franchise or brand they forged permanently places them in the golden age pantheon as masters of these two kinds of cinematic magic, the screwball comedy and the film noir classic. Now sometimes in the film noir classics there's black comedy, because Billy Wilder in particular 
was very fond of dark comedy. So even in tragedy, he has things that make us smile, chuckle, not quite laugh, but grin a little bit in the darkness. Precisely how they pulled this off so powerfully still remains a mystery. It's really what I'm writing about in this book, both the technique they had in working together, their dynamic, and the films themselves. One of the most famous comments about the two apparently competing theatrical genres of comedy and tragedy is, in fact, that comedy is simply tragedy plus time. This remark is often attributed to the great Carol Burnett. It was, in fact, uttered by Charles Brackett to Billy Wilder in a studio office of a Hollywood executive who was desperately trying to understand their original intention of making Sunset Boulevard as a comedy. It was supposed to be a comedy at the beginning. And they had a whole range of different actresses that were going to play in a comedy. The studio executives couldn't relate to that at all. Uh, the darkness of it and the opening of the film was a little more comedic than one we know and we're familiar with. But like McCartney and Lennon, another of the most influential partnerships in history, and one most accurately designated in that order, Bracken and Wilder each needed the balancing opposite aspect of the other in order to fruitfully produce and manage their mutual gifts. They were both brilliant, but they became apotheosis of brilliance when they were together in the same room. Even though they frequently fought physically, and my second cousin would throw telephone books at Billy Wilder, literally across the room. But out of that, they produced these, these magical expressions on celluloid. One without the other could be great, compelling, even delightful. And Billy Wilder, of course, after their divorce, so-called, in 1950, after Sunset Boulevard, went on to make many great films. And indeed, Charles Brackett went on to make many great films. He made Titanic right after that in 53. He won an Academy Award for that film with Clifton Webb and Barbara Stanwyck. I think a better Titanic version than uh, James Cameron's version with those two kid actors. <laughs> because in his version, there was a real boat. In James Cameron's, there was all computer generation, and they were standing on basically a blue set. So there was a real, they also had Barbara Stanwyck. Come on. <laughs> you know. So one without the other, good but not great. The heads and tails of a superbly minted coin. Bracken and Wilder's amazing 13-year partnership that I'll touch on a little bit before getting even really into Sunset Boulevard, because Sunset Boulevard is about the first, really, the 10 years they had as writers, when they were suffering as struggling writers, and that they were constantly being squashed by the executives and losing the freedom, having their beautiful lines changed at will. They had no control. But each of the films they made leads them through seeing the darkness of Hollywood, the darker side of celebrity worship, in effect, um, up to a film that's about Hollywood itself, the underside of Hollywood. But it re began rather arbitrarily in 1938, when producers at Paramount tossed together the barely English-speaking Wilder, literally, and the worldly and senior literary figure Bracken and told them to write Bluebeard's Eight Wife for the great Ernst Lubitsch. Wonderful film, Ernst Lubitsch, great European director, Little Shop Around the Corner was one of his masterpieces. But Bracken and Wilder quickly bristled at having other producers and directors wielding power over their hard-fought words, even when the results were as marvelous as their fine films with the great director, Mitchell Lyson, which includes Midnight, 1939, with the great Don Amici. Arise, My Love, 1940. Hold Back the Dawn, 1941. And after concocting the wacky wordplay of a ball of fire for Howard Hawks in 1941, the last film they would write for other people to control and produce and direct, Bracken and Wilder swore that they themselves would write and produce and direct all of their own future work. After the gentle silliness of the superb major and the minor, in which Ginger Rogers portrays a, a grown woman pretending to be a 12-year-old girl on a train so she can get half fare because she's run out of money, and runs into Ray Milland, who falls in love with her. It's a very quirky love story. You would never really know if he knows that she's 12. That was part of the double entendre. But then they moved into the more penetrating creating a string of popular creative hits which explored the full spectrum of human emotions, from the dark claustrophobia of Five Graves to Cairo in 1943 and the Oscar-winning paranoia of Lost Weekend in 1945 to the subtle, incisive political satire of A Foreign Affair in 1948, which is kind of about collaboration with American soldiers and German women, in this case, Marlena Dietrich, another fantastic diva. But it was clearly the bone-chilling, dark, noir nightmare of 1950's Sunset Boulevard, a disturbing meditation on our attachment to celebrity and the manic self-absorption of Hollywood itself, for which Bracken and Wilder are rightfully remembered as the cinematic artists par excellence. It alone is visionary in its insights into the fame-addicted world we now inhabit. 
It also changed my life forever when I saw it on television that lonely rainy day and was pretending to be ill. Very scary film. Not horrifying, but way scarier than just simple ordinary horror such as Frankenstein. It still has the power to change your life today. So looked at in, t in its entirety, the collaborative career of Charles Bracken and Billy Wilder can easily be compared to those 13 records in the way they made 13 films compared to the 13 records created by the Beatles, both in their sheer impact on popular culture and the fact that the two creative partners didn't like each other and were opposites of the same coin but needed each other, and in the intimacy and almost alchemical insights of their difficult but magical partnership. Growing up bracket, as I like to call it as a youth, was supercharged emotionally. It was very intense, not because I had any special treatment, because we were the Canadian branch of the family and weren't as crazy as the Hollywood uh, people. Crazy enough. But really it was intense because I kept on seeing their films on television. And always in black and white, always when no one was around for some reason, maybe a babysitter. But I would turn on the television and see my cousin produce this, and then I would be drawn into the world. It showed me two things of importance to me later in life. Uh, one, that movies are magic. They create a whole parallel world that you can travel into. And secondly, that you can be completely, well, that life doesn't go on forever, in, in a sense, especially Sunset Boulevard. Because it opens with the murder. The person who's narrating the film is already dead, as you clearly remember, William Holden. But how unique their vision was, especially Sunset Boulevard, in a place called Hollywood, an exotic place that I felt he had taken me to visit on travels. So I started to feel like he was taking me on travels, although I never met him. He died in 69 when I was 18. But he took me on this kind of film noir vacation and voc voc vocation. But what other places did he take me? Uh, solely to places located in the geography of his imagination. And I think we all know we can travel in films for two and a half hours or three hours. Um, places created as the gifted Academy Award winning screenwriter and producer during that golden age. The dreams we dream alone are merely dreams, as fascinating as they might be, whereas the dreams we dream together in a film theater form the very foundational structure of our culture itself. And when you, you're emotionally reacting to a film in a theater in the dark, usually darker than this, usually we might burst out laughing or crying and look around to see, and it's a strange feeling to look at other people in a the theater watching a film. It's spooky, it's a very exotic sort of bonding experience that you're having. It's almost too intimate because you're really all by yourself if it's a great film, completely traveling into that world of the imagination, and suddenly you realize there are 200 other people around you. It's quite shocking. But I like to explore the dynamics behind the creation of Sunset Boulevard, a highly combustible and competitive partnership between the director, Wilder, and writer-producer, my second cousin, Charles Brackett, as well as the huge social impact of the film. There are the two individuals, the culprits in question. Uh, Charles Brackett on the left, Billy Wilder on the right. In particular, the fascination with fame, which is really what S Sunset Boulevard is all about, which has saturated our contemporary popular culture. That'll be examined, as will the prophetic nature of the movie in showing us all this unbridled star adulation. Philosophers have a name for this fixation on the self that I don't like to blame young people for it, but they're the ones that seem to be celebrating it. The self alone, it's solipsism which means you only think of the self. And also you broadcast your individual, what you had last night for dinner or something on these tweets, which is something I've never been able to get into, probably because I can't condense what I want to say into 140 letters, <laughs> perhaps. But also it's just, it's, it invites us to say trivial things, like what you had for dinner last night, or the other one, Facebook. I can't really relate to that either. And it's not because I'm an old-fashioned crank, although I probably am, but I, it's just too personal, the interface, to divulge everything you're doing. I prefer the interface of films where we share them together. Um, their relationship, of course, was between uh, 38 and 1950. So that's 10 years of making these 12 films that are great masterpieces. They couldn't take it anymore, though, by the, the end. And I think, um, to a large extent, Billy Wilder wanted to liberate himself even from the relationship with the partner, even though it ameliorated his dark side and brought a lighter side into play. That was the year my cousin could no longer stand the constant conflict and bickering in a serious way with his partner, the gifted but darkly disturbed Wilder, after which he made some 39 more films without him. Huge number of films. And of course, Billy went on to make great films, some like It Hot, Seven, seven Year Itch, those kinds of films. 
but it's the curated appreciation of their masterpiece piece, Sunset Boulevard that we want to focus on here, and the prescient way in which they predicted the rise of our popular culture, which is enthralled by, captivated by, even controlled by, the insular vagaries of self-centered spotlights. And of course, no one played that self-centered spotlight quite as profoundly as uh, Gloria Swanson. The film seems more like philosophy or sociology in a funny sort of way, in the way it assumes the shape of popular entertainment. And in doing so, it's either a comedic or a tragic format. But it's shocking back then when I first saw it, and it still is. The same entertainment world had bestowed an Academy Award on them three times, Lost Weekend, Sunset Boulevard, and Titanic. So they were somehow masters of these two very different idioms, comedy and tragedy. Even Sunset Boulevard has occasional moments of lighthearted banter and wit, but it still conceals something corrosive beneath its sophisticated cloak of ultra-chic black satire. It's a black comedy, and it really does look at the industry of the, the dream factory of Hollywood in quite a surprising, shocking way. And as I said, they prevented the studios from really knowing what it was about. Wilder created a phony name for the film. It was called A Can of Beans. <laughs> That's not going to frighten anybody. And they would, one page of script at a time. They had the whole thing worked out, although they never really finished it until the, the, screen, uh, the, the screening and the filming started. But they never showed anything very much. They never showed rushes. They never showed a little footage to them, to the studios, because it was about the studio. But together, they helped construct this glittering age of Hollywood land, which is best remembered as an architecturally scaled prescription drug. That's what Hollywood land is. It's designed to help people survive two world wars, the Great Depression, the Cold War, many other lesser daily but equally unsettling challenges. It's a transformative feat. And it was from this broiling cauldron of cinematic creativity that one of the most prophetic films ever produced came into being, turning into a dark mirror on the dream industry that sustained them both, and predicting the rise of our age of self-absorption. 62 years later, it seems that everybody and their uncle is ready for their close-up, for our close-up, which is that twisted closing line of Sunset Boulevard and that a solipsistic narcissism has become just a matter of fact, so much so that we don't really even notice it. But it's an ill-advised response to this media-saturated world of ours, a world in which reality and actuality and popular entertainment have been blurred together in a fascinating but somewhat threatening way, not unlike Sunset Boulevard itself. All of these actresses were considered for the part. They were all approached. And before talking just briefly about them, Greta Garbo, Pola Negri on the right, Mae West, when it really was going to be a comedy, and Mary Pickford, each of whom in 1950 was a somewhat faded older star. But think about what older means, because William Holden said to Gloria, you're 50, there's nothing wrong with that. 50 was considered really ancient in those days. Um, and in fact, when this became a hit and she won an Academy Award, they gave her a special um, sort of a cosmetic contract She's 50, and she looks 35, or whatever it was, because it was something miraculous. Now, Greta Garbo really did retire at 35 years old. She didn't make any films after 1941. And Billy Wilder and Brackett, they approached her and said, we want you to make this film. It's about a, well, they tried to be delicate, of course, because everyone loves Greta Garbo, especially my cousin, apparently. When they made Ninochka in 1939 with Greta Garbo, in which the, bait, the famous line was, Garbo laughs, for the first time in cinema. Ten years earlier, it had been Garbo Talks. It was a sound. Um, he was so in love with her that he used to almost stalk her on the set. The producer didn't need to be there, and Billy was the director, and he kept saying, hey, Charlie, what do you, why don't you leave Greta alone? He was gawking at her doing all the scenes, and he put up, Billy put up a special screen, like almost a medical, you know, a hospital screen, t so she could, this guy's bugging me. I, I can't, why is he always staring at me? And then one day, Billy came and saw Charlie on his knees, looking through a crack in this screen at Greta Garbo. Anyway, she retired at, at 35. She could not be enticed to come back. Paula Negri, she was a very famous European actress from uh, Poland, very exotic. Oh, no. Each of them said, no, I'm Greta Garbo. I can't play a has-been star. Mae West said, well, the whole film has to be about me, and it has to be a comedy, and I have to have muscle builders with me, the usual Mae West story. Mary Pickford, a very sweet Canadian actress, but couldn't quite relate. Leilene Gish was another one. Uh, Marlena Dietrich wasn't quite old enough, but it's so relative when we think about today uh, what it means for baby boomers to be 50. That was like 20 years ago, gee. 
But it is 1950 now. Charles Bracken and Billy Wilder had collaborated on over a dozen films before Sunset Boulevard, some better received than others. Last weekend won the best prize at both Cannes and the Academy Awards, to date the only two, one of two films to do so. Now, this of course is the cast that eventually uh, brings the film to light. William Holden on the left, a young actor at that time. He had been in Picnic with Kim Novak, um, he would be the kind of Brad Pitt of the day, I think, would be fair to say. Uh, Gloria Swanson, Nancy Olson, Olson, and the great Eric von Stroheim. And that is definitely true, a most unusual picture. It wasn't called Can of Beans, as the studio thought it was. It was about them. Um, for reasons that remain unspoken, if not unknown, the two men, Brackett and Wilder, never worked together after this film. Brackett went one way, Wilder another. But their legacy endures in the form of this, their final and best remembered effort. Wordsmiths, both of them, Bracken and Wilder framed what many consider their magnum opus through the lens of, what else, a struggling screenwriter named Joe Gillis, who really was their surrogate, because that was them 10 years ago at that point, who happens upon a seemingly empty mansion while ducking a pair of creditors. There he meets the real star of Sunset Boulevard, one Norma Desmond. Gloria Swanson has to be applauded for saying, I'll undertake this film. Uh, it wasn't a comeback, it was Gloria realizing she's the only star who can do it. She still was the diva, but she didn't have the same, perhaps, ego problems of Greta Garbo and Mae West, particularly Mae West. She was impossible. But you also have to remember what we saw there and what you've all seen, the darkness of that film noir style. It was originally a comedy. The first few scenes that they filmed in a morgue uh, had dead bodies laying out almost like CSI, a crime scene investigation story on television, where they are always out at the morgue laying there. And all the bodies were laying there, including William Holden. And he was the narrator of the film in the original version. Uh, and each of them had a toe tag, I guess, that are attached to the bodies. And they each stood, sat up and started narrating what happened to them, why they were killed, how they died, <laughs> and one after the other. And of course, it had that impact, because no matter how strange it was as an idea, and it was kind of, it freaked out the studios, but they prevented them from doing that. And it also then turned into far from a comedy. But that's how it originated. The effect was immediate. Sunset Boulevard won three of the 11 Oscars for which it was nominated, include one, including one for Brackett for the screenwriter, Wilder, and one for Franz Waxman, the composer of the music. A very lush, romantic, dramatic music, but it captures some of the essence of what was flowing through uh, the celluloid veins of Norma Desmond or Gloria Swanson. Norma is at once an unrivaled narcissist and a hopelessly lost soul. We don't really laugh at her. We sort of feel sorry for her, and we move into her fantasy world, and we sympathize with her, even though she's getting crazier and crazier, because she brings uh, Holden out to buy clothes for him, and she basically molds him into a gigolo. Unable or unwilling to accept that her best years are behind her, she's still waiting proudly to parade, waving proudly to a parade that has long since passed her by, as Joe puts it. She screens her old films and forces Joe to watch them, which is very creepy because she's emoting from this divan she lays on, and Joe is next to her with his martini getting more and more nervous because he's getting trapped in this strange, uh, nightmarish world. So she forces him to write also, a new film, Salome, which she imagined she's in at the end when she's totally flipped her wig, uh, the new film. And in general, carrying on as though she remains the girl, the it girl that she once was. The real it girl, remember, was Theda Barra. And Theda Barra was sort of almost like Pola Negri as well. And of course, we have it girls today. This Kate Winslet, uh, Winslet, I guess, is the it girl today. Whoever encapsulates the magic of the moment as an actor or an actress is the their lives, of course, are very limited, though, because we eventually want more it people, fresher, younger versions. But her manservant, Max, the great Eric von Stroheim, one of the great European directors of all time, it reveals also that it's sort of a reality program, this film, because you've got these famous actors in it. Buster Keaton plays in it. Uh, Anna Nilsson plays in it. Uh, the, the person who was in the first King of Kings film it was a silent film. And DeMille, of course, films... Uh, his own role is DeMille. So there's a strange reality program version in, in this film. When Joe tells her that she can be big again, she responds with those immortal words, I am big, it's the pictures that got small, something I actually agree with. But host to those lies, 
agreed upon is what Gillis calls a great big white elephant of a house, as drab as it is glamorous. Among its many odd facets, a drained pool with rats scuttling about it, which she fills up for him, ironically, so he can have a pool, and he has one <laughs> towards the end. The ghost of a, of a tennis court and a garden that serves as the final resting place of Norma's recently deceased pet monkey. If you remember one of the creepiest scenes in this film, is she's very sad, and he's, the pet monkey is a chimpanzee, and he's laid out on a table like a morgue, covered in a, some sort of a velvet robe, and Max is going to bury him with a full ceremony of honors in the backyard. It's very, very scary. There are no locks in any of the doors or any handles e either, so that Max may once again more easily reach her when she next attempts suicide, which she does regularly throughout the film. And in fact, she only kills him because she's got the gun and she's showing it to William Holden, saying, I'm going to kill myself. And that's when he says, no one knows you. No one's going to care that you're gone. They think you're already dead. And that flips her out, of course. But clear-cut evidence of Norma's fragile state of mind to anyone on the outside looking in. The house is Norma's sanctuary from the outside world. And her last line of defense against the fact that her greatness is now spoken of only in the past tense. This tension between the inner and the outer, the perceived reality versus the actual reality embodied by the mansion, creates that pervading sense of disenchantment that permeates the entire film. There's a magic in the film, but a sort of gloomy detachment from reality that's very captivating. This, of course, is the scene that captivated me when I was 10 years old, staying home. Watch that, and I realized those two things. First, we don't live forever. We can go at any time. And second, you can be drawn into a magic world, whether or not it's a relative making the movie. Movies are magic because we're living in another world, a parallel world, uh, one that could be better than ours, one that can be worse, one that can be just like ours. But as alluded to before, the choice to use a writer as a means by which we're made privy to the film's goings-on and the narration of that writer, to say nothing of its underlying meaning, was no doubt a very targeted one. Joe is both a part of and separate from the machinations of Hollywood because he's an unsuccessful writer. He opens the film, in fact, by saying, I had a couple of scripts kicking around Paramount. Well, Paramount is the studio that first threw Bracken and Wilder together and made them partner all the way through many years of great masterpieces. But it's also the studio that itself is being lampooned in the film that's being made. And the studio executives completely almost fainted when they saw the finished film because they were expecting something called a can of beans. It was a comedy. And yes, it had Gloria Swanson, but all of a sudden, well, this is about us. And they, they, the blood chilled in their veins. And what amounts to one of its, the film's most subtle developments, Joe gradually becomes complicit in her delusions. He has nowhere to go. He has no money. She's buying him clothes. She gets a car for him. So he begins unconsciously to become really her new pet monkey in a strange sort of way. He's taken on to refine her script and thus one would imagine provides some semblance of organization to what is really a chaotic screenplay. It makes no sense at all because she's writing it from a crazy point of view. Instead, he lets her madness seep into his own life. The reason why is simple, greed. While under Norma's live-in employ, enjoys all those luxuries that come with the wealth, he sees no reason to end it. In so doing, he becomes part of the small but vocal echo chamber, reminding Norma of her greatness. Or in his words, quote, I didn't argue with her. You don't yell at a sleepwalker. He may fall and break his neck. That's it. She was still sleepwalking among the giddy heights of a lost career, playing crazy when it came to one subject, her celluloid self, the great Norma Desmond. How could she breathe in that house so crowded with Norma Desmonds? More Des Norma Desmonds and still more Norma Desmonds. Every room you went into, there were 23 pictures of her framed in gilt frames. Very claustrophobic, obviously. Sequestered within this palatial home, though it is, Sunset Boulevard manages to evoke Hollywood in a manner unlike any other film. The one that comes closest to that is David Lynch's Mulholland Drive, a very scary film about Hollywood. And in fact, David Lynch might be the Billy Wilder of today, the darker Billy Wilder, but it's clearly a disciple of this film. And this film impacted many directors like David Lynch, of course. Norma's House is a sort of living museum that exhibits the highs and lows of Hollywood, which exists in the films less as a place and more as a state of mind. And of course, each state of mind in Hollywood is replaced by the next decade, the next style. And we're in now one that we, we might find it hard to imagine what can come after the present state of mind in Hollywood because of its self-absorbed wickedness, its viciousness, its violence, it's beyond belief. Nothing is ever inferred or suggested, it's literally shown. Um, in the golden age of the iconic screwball comedies or the film noir, the couple might leave the room and go into uh, a bedroom and the light will go off. That's about it. 
in those kinds of films with um, Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant or something, you know, or Claudette Colbert and Clark Gable, you know those people are getting it on, so to speak, but they don't have to be shown because they're so elegant, they portray this magic, the passion they certainly portray, you simply don't need to be shown that. But now, everything needs to be shown. Gloria Swanson, who plays Norma, was herself the biggest star during the silent era, hadn't worked much prior to Sunset Boulevard, but agreed bravely, I think, incredibly courageously, I'll go into this film and play the fated star Norma Desmond. Now, I think it's both half bravery and half the fact that she really was Norma Desmond. That's quite different from asking Mary Pickford or Greta Garbo to play Norma Desmond. Uh, but this very close to being madness of her own allowed her to, I don't think she was acting, to tell you the truth. She was <laughs> emoting, perhaps. But Cecil B. DeMille was also in the film, of course, who had directed Swanson many times, and Anna Q. Nilsson. They all make cameos. And the true relationship between Norma and Max, of course, that he used to direct her, was also true of Swanson and Eric von Stroheim, who plays Max. For sure, this was the first reality program, but people didn't really realize it because it was 50 or 60 years ahead of its time. But it's troubling, as it is unsurprising, that the aspects of Sunset Boulevard most effective in skewering Hollywood are those that draw more from reality than they do from the collective imagination of Bracken and Wilder. Anyone looking for Tinseltown to air its dirty laundry in public can nowadays simply turn on E! True Hollywood on television, that program, the Hollywood story. But Sunset Boulevard's blistering portrayal of the specters haunting the city was therefore unprecedented, and it was unrecognized. People didn't really realize at the time how futuristic it really was. What's more, it could easily be argued that its vision remains unsurpassed in that particular regard. A too literal but nonetheless poignant scene occurs when Norma decides to confront Cecil B. DeMille on the set of his newest picture in order to ask him what he thinks of his screenplay. DeMille, who has no interest in the script at all, politely exchanged niceties with Norma before having her sit in his director's chair, which is dark at that point. It's not long until people start to notice her, but the spotlight operator up above suddenly notices this woman in the dark sitting in Cecil B. DeMille's chair. He moves the spotlight over to her, and suddenly she's illuminated in this blazing light. Suddenly the entire set stops because they see her in the spotlight. In other words, she's only alive in that spotlight. And they all rush over to her getting autographs and surrounding her, and she, of course, is, is in her magical milieu. Much to her delight, the light is directly on her face. DeMille notices, breaks up the crowd, and says, turn that light back where it belongs. Unintentionally slighting her, of course, because it belongs on whoever's being filmed at that moment, not the person from 30 years ago. So revered for who she once was, but no longer relevant. Her vanity-driven inability to move on from yesteryear keeps her in a state of suspended animation. And our pity for her grows at roughly the same rate as our dislike. She gives us the creeps for sure, but we really start to feel for her because of the, the situation she's in. And perhaps most disconcerting about all this is the fact that Norma's lot is hardly worth lamenting. She's treated like a goddess by everyone who comes across her. She hasn't worked in years, but seems to have done little to reduce her stature in Hollywood royalty. Indeed, there's no indication that her absence from the screen was due to a series of unsuccessful appearances that weakened her star power, rather than a sort of self-imposed exile at the height of her fame, just like Garbo. Garbo retreated to New York, far away from Hollywood, and I used to send Greta Garbo in New York love letters when I was a teenager, because I found out what her address was, and I would send her postcards. I was absorbed by her, I guess, just as much as my great cousin was. But it isn't enough for Norma. Her vanity and security are inextricably linked, and neither will allow for reality to dawn on her in any meaningful way. She's something of a living legend, but she's also an unaware ghost, no longer in the world in which she thinks she lives. An example of their chatty banter, uh, Charles Bracken on the left, of course, always very natty, formally dressed, conservative fellow, while they're looking much more like a sort of Hollywood hunk. Uh, always chatting her up at the dress, dressing room door. In the end, when it all comes crashing down, as we know it must, police arrive in a scene in a callback to the film's opening sequence, which is that long tracking, tracking shot over the asphalt of Sunset Boulevard's street name that gives the palm trees and the sirens, gives way to their entrance. Norma's house now crawls with members of the press and the LAPD alike. She convinces herself, or at least pretends, in her madness, that they're crew members on her new film. She really has slipped the bounds of reality at that point and believes that she's being filmed and ready for her close-up. Even as they're taking her away charged with murder, in her deluded mind, she's back on the set with lights, camera, and action. Um, 
Everyone expected that film to win the Academy Award, certainly for, it won three out of the 11, but certainly for Gloria Swanson. There's a shot of Billie Holiday, a very young actress at the time, Jose Ferrar in the middle, and Gloria Swanson on the, his left. And they're pretending to have, just before the announcement is made, crossing their figures, Gloria Swanson is praying like this. The Oscar for Best Actress actually went to Billie Holiday for Born Yesterday, the film with Broderick Crawford and, weirdly enough, William Holden in that same film, playing a writer who Broderick Crawford has hired to help Billie Holiday learn how to speak English, in a sense, because she's, she's Billie Holiday. But she, of course, was a very gifted actress. Everyone was quite stunned, though, when the, uh, the other film, Sunset Boulevard, didn't win, although it did win for uh, Best Screenplay, Best Music, Best uh, Producer. A uh, scene of Charles Bracken and Billy Wilder trying to calm down Nancy Olsen, the young actress, when Gloria Swanson had exploded at her at one moment. She ran out, and basically they're just trying to say, everything's going to be fine. You're going to be as big as Gloria Swanson. To the best of my memory, Nancy Olsen didn't exactly become a household word, though, after this. But the best motion picture was won by uh, Paramount, Charles Brackett, producer. Best director, it was certainly nominated. Billy Wilder didn't win. Best actor was nominated William Holden. Best actress nominated Gloria Swanson. Best writing did win the award at the Academy for Charles Brackett and Billy Wilder. Best supporting actor was Eric von Stroheim, a really gifted genius, really crazy, but a phenomenally gifted European director. Best supporting actress Nancy Olsen was nominated. Best art direction won for Hans Dreyer, John Meehan, and Samuel Kummer. And the art direction is really profound because you're kept in this museum claustrophobic old mansion. But of course, it's, it's a perfect mirror of the kind of Hollywood world at the time. Best cinematography was nominated. Best film editing, it's gorgeously edited because it's just seamless. You just flow along through this dreamlike state. And best music for score of a dramatic picture was, of course, won by Franz Waxman. Melodramatic music, but absolutely perfect because it seemed to echo the passion pumping through the mad Norma. Its 11 nominations were exceeded only by the 14 received by All, Ab All About Eve. Weirdly enough, ironically, another crazy self-absorbed actress played by Betty Davis in All About Eve, uh, which won six awards, including Best Picture and Best Director. So it was a really uh, a horse match between All About Eve, and they were really similar, because the one, Betty Davis was competing with um, the young actress who was um, sort of trying to replace her on the screen eventually as, as an extra. One um, instead, many critics predicted the Best Actress Award would go to Swanson. Real shock when they didn't. Most of all, the Swanson, of course. But Betty Davis didn't get it either for All About Eve, and they were surprised that the recipient was Judy Holliday for Born Yesterday. Weirdly, the same year, William Holden is in that film. Those were the years when great actors were in great three or four films in the, in the same year. Now, people can't make a film in three or four years. In an interview years later, uh, Betty Davis bluntly stated that she and Swanson had canceled each other out as great stars, had just couldn't, neither one of them could win. But it also won Golden Globe Awards, uh, Writers Guild Awards, Director Guild Awards, uh, Wilder for Outstanding Directorial Achievement, and the National Board of Review voted it Best Picture, at which point Swanson did receive the Best Actress. So Wilder and Brackett began working on this script in 1948, which is um, really 10 years after their uh, debut being thrown together by Paramount. And remember, Wilder could hardly speak English. He just arrived from uh, Austria. Um, Charlie Brackett was a kind of member of the literary royalty. He was in Europe during the 1920s with the Lost Generation, as it was called. He wrote a book in 29 called American Colony about the expatriate uh, stars and writers and actors and artists that went there. So he was chumming around with people like F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway and Gertrude Stein all of whom he helped, by the way, through their binges with alcohol, especially Fitzgerald and Hemingway. He was a teetotaler, Charlie Brackett, never drank, and that somehow gave him research for, what, eight years later, Lost Weekend with Ray Milland about an alcoholic. But he then went to New York and became the drama critic for The New Yorker and hung out with the Algonquin Room people, Dorothy Parker, um, Alexander Woolcott, Robert Benchley, and that's when Hollywood sort of grabbed him because they liked to pick these famous writers. They brought, in fact, William Faulkner went to Hollywood. Aldous Huxley, who was a friend of uh, Charlie Brackett, went to, to Hollywood. And once they start offering you $5,000 a week to write film scripts, you sort of go there, even if, you're, even if you've won a Nobel Prize like William Faulkner. F. Scott Fitzgerald and all of those people, though, could not write film scripts. So they just got the $5,000 a week, got drunk, and, and just became sour, really. But the... 
The results of working on the script didn't entirely satisfy them. In an effort to keep the full details from Paramount Pictures and avoid the restrictive censorship of the Breen Code at the time, they submitted the script only a few pages at the time, as I mentioned. The Breen Code is a version of the Hayes Office, which is a censorship office that opened in Hollywood in 1934. And there's really only one reason they opened that censorship office. The first few films of the 1929, 30, 31, 32, and 33 were incredibly violent gangster movies, um, like Scarface with Paul Muni, and it was about Al Capone. Little Caesar, also about Al Capone with Edward G. Robinson. Um, and a lot of films that were incredibly violent. There was no control over violence at that point. Then the Hayes office and the Breen office came into effect, and they censored films, both sexual content and violence, right up until 1968. And so these artists had to work within these really constrained um, limits. And I believe that enhanced their creativity, because I think limits are important to artists. Being without limits are not actually the best thing for artists, because then they, they're just sort of anything they do they think is great. But if you're working within really constrained parameters, you have to be extremely creative. And that's what I think is missing from today's uh, world. Paramount executives thought Wilder was adapting a story called The Can of Beans, which did not exist. It allowed him relative freedom to proceed as he saw fit. Only the first third of the script was written when the filming began. So it ends up being this masterpiece, very much along the lines of um, Casablanca. One of the most surprising things about that film is that nobody knew what the ending was. Any of the actors, nobody knew even what their lines were until the day they went to act in the film. And it was one of the most incredible flukes that that film is, is so revered. Because it, of course, has something more magical than order, organization, good planning. It has uh, Bergman, Claude Rains, and Paul Henry, and of course Bergman, and Bergman, and Bergman. But the script does contain many references to Hollywood and to screenwriters, with Joe Gillis making most of the cynical comments. He sums up his film writing career with the remark, the last one I wrote was about Okies in the Dust Bowl. You never know, because when it reached the screen, the whole thing was played on a torpedo boat, which often happened to these writers. You write one thing, and the studio executives just change it completely around. In another exchange, Betty comments to Gillis, uh, quote, I've always heard you had some talent. He replies, that was last year. This year, I'm trying to make a living. <laughs> Things change quickly in Hollywood. But the fusion of writer-director Billy Wilder's biting humor with Brackett's urbane literary style and the classic elements of film noir make for a strange kind of comedy, as well as a strange kind of film noir. There are no belly laughs here, but there are certainly strangled giggles, as when the pet chimp's midnight funeral takes place. Um, just in passing, this of course is the great glory in a publicity shot, but what I've added there is a, a quote that I return to again and again in, in the book. Celebrity is a mask which eats into the face. And it's a quote that comes from the great American author, uh, John Updike. That, and you can feel what it means. It's one of those amazing, insightful lines that the mask you start wearing, eventually you can't take off. And it eats into your face and it becomes your real face. And we've seen many tragic stories about actors and actresses that, that are in the same boat. Um, several of Desmond's lines, of course, such as, all right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. And I am big, the pictures that got small are widely remembered and quoted. Much of the film's wit is delivered through Norma Desmond's deadpan comments, which we never know if she's actually self-satirizing or, or if she's dreadfully serious. They're often followed by sarcastic retorts from Gillis. And all the comments from Joe Gillis, the very sarcastic, sort of biting, cynical comments, um, are very much Bracken and Wilder's direct aim at the studio executives and how the machinations of the, the factory-like machine of Hollywood needs to start grinding out films. And today, of course, we live in a world that's inherited the consequences of that, because films take five years to make, seven years to make. Uh, if you're Terrence Malick, they make 10 years to make. And um, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. But within very small budgets, relatively, one or two million or three million dollars, these films, and with the censorship office, you get remarkable works of art. Desmond appears to not hear some of these comments as she absorbs, is absorbed by her own thoughts and in denial. And so some of Gillis's lines are heard only by the audience, and I think that's what we're supposed to feel. We're on the inside track, behind the scenes, with Wilder blurring the line between the events and Gillis's narration. Gillis's response to Desmond's cry that the pictures got small is a muttered reply, I knew something was wrong with them. 
So that's like a funny sort of comment by writers like Bracken and Wilder, but it also goes by so quickly that you just think it's the writer's cynicism. Wilder often varies the structure with Desmond taking Gillis's comment seriously and replying in kind. As, for instance, when the two discuss the overwrought script that Desmond has been working on about Salome, it's totally melodramatic. It, it, there isn't even a word to describe how melodramatic it is. And Joe Gillis observes, yeah, they'll really love it in Pomona. And he rolls his eyes. And she says, totally seriously, they'll love it everywhere. <laughs> because it's got me in it. Film writer Richard Corliss describes Sunset Boulevard as, quote, the definitive Hollywood horror movie. And it really does feel like a horror movie, noting that almost everything in the script is ghoulish. He remarks that the story is narrated by a dead man who Norma Desmond first mistakes for an undertaker, thinking that he's there to bury her chimp, while most of the film takes place in an old, dark house that only opens its doors to the living dead. He compares von Stroheim's character Max to Eric the Phantom of, op of the Opera and Norma Desmond with Dracula. She very, is kind of vampiric in her nature, noting that as she seduces Joe Gillis, the camera tactfully withdraws from the traditional directorial attitude taken towards Dracula's jugular seductions. And she, you do feel when he's, she's kissing him that it's his lifeblood that she's taking out of him. He writes that the narrative contains an excess of cheap sarcasm, done on purpose, of course, but ultimately congratulates the writers for attributing this dialogue to Joe Gillis, who in any case presented a little more, is presented as a little more than a hack writer. Wilder preferred to leave analysis of his screenplays and films to others. He, one thing about him, he seemed very, he pretended to be very modest, although he was a phenomenal egomaniac. He appeared to just let everything roll off his back. When asked if Sunset Boulevard was a black comedy, he replied, no, it's just a picture. I don't, I don't analyze anything. If they buy tickets, I'm happy. So, and that's true, of course, because he did think that Hollywood was supposed to be entertaining people. And indeed, I mean, it still is supposed to be, but many directors take themselves a little too seriously. But there is uh, Gloria, of course, on the left, charming Billy. And Billy was a very charming individual, for sure. A publicity shot of the, uh, the group of the stars reveling. And this sort of shows the way the writer-producer and writer-director, Bracken and Wilder, worked. They would work together, have their fights, long drinking matches, at least with one drinking 7-Up and one drinking bourbon, and throwing telephone books, etc. long overnight uh, binges. And then they would bring their material to the secretary and both sort of dictate it in that incredibly close, claustrophobic style. Great picture of um, Bracken and Wilder again with the star in the studio office. And that gives you an idea, speaking of the vampire quality of, of her seduction. When we watch films and we realize how magic they are, we're really into this intimate relationship, even a strange one like, like Holden and, and Swanson. We feel, if it's successful, that we're alone in bed with these people. We're somehow secretly in their room. And of course, you always have to be reminded that there are 100 people around there. There are lighting people and stage people. And then there's director there showing what he wants the cameraman to do. And yet they still manage to pull off this. And that's, of course, what makes great actors and actresses phenomenally great. And of course, there are plenty of great ones today. That's the before and after realization of the great star that she was. And I think she still was even a greater star when she did Sunset Boulevard because of that capacity to go down into the deep well of herself, way past where the ego is. Uh, remember, it's the ego that stopped Greta Garbo and Mae West and Mary Pickford from portraying the faded star. I think she's really gifted because she was able to have that, that bravery, assuming she wasn't really nuts like Norma Desmond. But that's from uh, the left side is from Queen Kelly, which is about 1922. Uh, a masterpiece by Eric von Stroheim. He was noted in Hollywood as a madman from Europe who made films that were sometimes six hours long, eight hours long. He submitted films and he expected the director to let, let this pass. One of his masterpieces, I think, is called Greed. And Greed, I think, went on for 12 hours and it just drove the studio executives crazy because they wanted films that were barely two hours. Um, and it was an amazing film, if you see the long version of it. And a lot of really long films, like Abel Gans's Napoleon, uh, very innovative, and it does last for four hours if you watch the... The only people in Hollywood like that have already changed their tune. I mean, um, uh, Coppola was kind of like that when he made the incredibly somewhat self-indulgent masterpieces like Apocalypse Now. But at that point, he was so successful, like uh, Wilder and Brackett, that he was allowed to do whatever he wanted to do. But that sort of shows the shift there. 
There's the famous chimp scene where he's dead. We don't know what it is under there. She thinks he's an undertaker there to bury it in the backyard, which is eventually done by Eric von Stroheim. And as he lifts the robe, the arm falls out. And it practically makes you faint because you realize the reverence that she's bestowing on this is like a 24-year-old chimp that's been with her since she was a famous star. And that's when Holden casts a glance at her and realizes, I'm in big trouble here <laughs> because I'm, I'm, the new, I'm the new pet chimp. <laughs> that's when she's screening her films, of course. And again, Holden, he's already 30, 40 years past that period of film. He doesn't see them anymore. Nobody watches those films anymore, except me, of course. And we know many of those films are great masterpieces, including Valentino's films, uh, D.W. Griffith's films. They're, we need to see those films because they sort of etched in celluloid the narrative techniques, as I said at the beginning, that are used today. But of course, he's looking, well, he's somewhat bored, yes. And of course, remember that Swanson is claiming that speaking, the talking films, is what destroyed real acting, because nobody has to act anymore because it's all in the hands of writers. And she thinks writers are just a waste of time. We had faces then. She used to say, we didn't need writers. And that's when she stands up, of course, right in the middle of the film that she's screening and starts to emote as if she's living in that film, blocking his view. This is her basic philosophy, of course. I'm rich in all this new Hollywood trash. And she was, because there were no taxes then, back when she was a silent star, no taxes at all. And she was forever permanently richer than any of the new stars. Who would be people like, oddly enough, William Holden or Kim Novak, or Marlon Brando. And she makes a funny remark about people like Brando in the way they read their lines. She doesn't actually say uh, Brando, but I think he was just only then famous for The Wild One. He hadn't even gone on to make his, his actually serious films. We didn't need dialogue, we had faces. There just aren't any faces like that anymore. Remember, she's looking at her own face <laughs> as she's saying that, which is true. Um, remember the other thing, when you retire at 35 like a Garbo, there's no courage to go on, like, for instance, great actresses like Meryl Streep. She doesn't seem to be overly concerned that she's 65 or whatever she is. Or Helen Mirren, for God's sake. She's a goddess, and she's going to go on until she, like, maybe falls off the stage. But she has the power as a human actress to, to emote forever. There's the great Eric von Stroheim. Anyone who can ever rent one of his films in order to learn how the narrative techniques of films were developed and of course, the irony is in this reality-like program of Sunset Boulevard, he plays her ex-husband and Max, the butler. And he's the one who's been writing all of the, the fan letters to her over the years. Nobody writes her, and he writes them every day. So she gets 100, 100 fan letters every day because he worships her. There she's, of course, toying with him in a very unnerving way with her, you know, leopard skin maybe shouldn't quite be worn by Gloria Swanson at this point. And he really is a toy. She goes out to buy clothes for him and uh, dolls him up. And that, of course, is how he ends up. And that moment where she emotes that final madness and goes towards the screen as it's blurring, there aren't moments like that that you can, it's really a handful of moments that end up with him being fished out of, yes, he got a pool. And it was pretty shocking to have the narrator, there's no mystery, you know who who was murdered, and you know, really, I mean, seconds after he meets Norma Desmond, who killed him. So the rest is just the unfolding of psychological drama. It's not suspense like a detective drama or a murder mystery. The mystery is how it just went on that long. And that gives you a sense of how he's squirming, because he doesn't just, she doesn't sit next to him, she sits right on top of him, <laughs> practically taking away the breath, from, and he's trying to smoke a cigarette, he's staring off, and he, how can I get out of here? And she's just, like, he's a poodle, and it, it's so beautifully acted, though, because the clash in emotion between his being trapped and her just profound Gloria Swanson-ness is, is just shocking. And this is the beauty, the irony, that this is him in Born Yesterday with uh, Judy Holliday, who is a superb actress. Uh, and he's also a writer in that film, also in 1950. And he's helping her, because she's a gangster's mall. And Broderick Crawford sort of forces her to sort of him to tutor her so he, she won't sound like a gangster's mall. He doesn't mind sounding like a real thug like Roger Crawford, speaking of great actors, but he doesn't want his, his babe to sound like a gangster's mall. There she's opining about the lost past, and you can see the pictures that he's surrounded by of her constantly everywhere he turns, the older pictures of her at the party where there's only 
just the musicians and them. I think that's when he realizes that he's in deep trouble. There are no other guests. We don't want them to spoil the evening for us. Some New Year's. And Cecil B. DeMille respects her, of course, because she's worthy of respect. She's a great actress, Norma Desmond, um, and still is. But he solicitously kind of explains, well, the real reason that the studio called her, they wanted to borrow her old Duesenberg automobile for a film which was about the old days in Hollywood. And they didn't want her. She thought, of course, they want me for a new film. So she immediately starts writing Salome. Um, but he, of course, explains, oh, someone made a mistake. And yes, we'll talk about this film later. He's very kind. And that's, of course, the real Cecil B. DeMille, as is the group that convenes when they play bridge every so often, who uh, Joe Gillis calls the Waxworks. They're played by really famous old stars like Buster Keaton, who has an amazing cameo in that, uh, Hedda Hopper is in that scene as well. That's when she starts coming towards us. And I can't remember anything scarier than being 10 years old and seeing that face come and dissolve, and then being left at home alone, speaking about home alone <laughs> with that, another Hollywood film. And she comes and keeps on coming, and her hand turns into this claw that t just devours us. And remember, she said, only me and those l wonderful people out there in the dark, which of course captures what the essence of movie magic is. Two great books to think about, easy to find, The Life and Times of Billy Wilder, which talks about their partnership and all the films he made, but a really wonderful book, Close Up on Sunset Boulevard, specifically about uh, the making of this film. Very helpful in the research. No one writes a book, of course, without 20 or 30 other books before us. Uh, and then we weave you know, new knowledge into them. This I just wanted to show because of the strange collaborative process that shows how close the dynamic collaboration between two creative geniuses is. And it spooks me because uh, Bracken and Wilder are there at the typewriter, and Wilder on his elbow like that, Lennon and McCartney at a point when they were breaking up and having extreme difficulties, and he's, Lennon is leaning on his elbow, and they're both writing something brilliant together. They're not writing it separately, and they both go on to make okay things separately, but nothing to compare to whatever that creative magic is. And indeed, this is my upcoming course, which is uh, based on this book, Cre Breaking Up is Hard to Do, Creative Marriages Made in Hell. That's about a whole range of partnerships, like Bracken and Wilder, Lennon McCartney, um, in all sorts of different disciplines, but especially film and, and music. Uh, partnerships that thrive on the competition between opposites, the union of opposites. And that's coming up in 1800 across the hall. I think it's May 17th. So two things in terms of self-promotion, which I shamelessly do, being from a, a Hollywood family, I have no shame. Um, Breaking Up is Hard to Do, it's in the catalog, you have to sign up for it, of course, across, uh, and that's May, May 17th, Creative Partnerships. And um, Strange Magic, the films of Bracken and Wilder, is at Cinematech, May 23rd. Now, for those who want to see Sunset Boulevard again, not on video in a small, in a small picture format, the opening double feature in my Strange Magic program at Cinematech on the 23rd is uh, Ninochka with Greta Garbo in the, in the beginning. That's from 1939, uh, where Garbo laughs. Although I must say to you that they couldn't get Garbo to laugh. My, my, you know, Bracken and Wilder were trying, they did 100 takes and she couldn't laugh. She was a great actress, supposedly. She could not laugh, they had to dub Greta Garbo's laughter. There's a moment with Melvin Douglas where he falls off a chair and, and Ninochka starts laughing for the first time in the film because she plays a communist, very dry, studying America in a way. She bursts out laughing, but it's not her laughter. That won't change the film for you, but it's just a really weird idea that, no, Gre Greta, try it again, try it again. Uh, and the double feature of the second part of the evening on May 23rd at Cinematheque is Sunset Boulevard. So in a big theater on Howe Street, seen in glorious black and white. So I hope you'll be able to enjoy that. Now we're at a question period now. Questions, comments, epiphanies. I think we have to have questions solo because our time has gone off. So okay. I would like to thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure sharing my obsessions with you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It was sir. a pleasure to listen to you. Thanks a lot. Enjoyed it. Thanks, folks.